الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته I apologize uh, for my tardiness and I just want to make sure that uh, the audience uh, can hear me well before uh, continuing Perfect alhamdulillah So before beginning the, the lecture, I actually wanted to begin uh, by thanking uh, Mashal al Farooq, uh, thanking uh, Brother Al Qadi, and thanking Munir, and all of the other brothers and sisters who had a hand uh, in this lecture and the program that you are currently attending and a part of. I also uh, wanted to lift uh, prayers for the project that uh, they have been actively working on uh, for several years and despite all of the ups and downs and all the challenges that they have faced in trying to make this project reach uh, fruition um, they have continued uh, to keep their nose to the grindstone they have continued to work uh, hard and vigorously and we all now see see the progress we can start to see the eye i'm sorry the light at the end of the tunnel and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to continue to bless uh, their efforts, continue to bless this project, and make the project a success by every measure. Ameen ya Rabbil Alameen. Uh, I also want to mention before beginning that I have been coming uh, to Mashal al Farooq uh, for this program and for other programs annually for about a decade. And uh, I have met many of you personally and you have given me the impression that you enjoyed uh, the programming, enjoyed the lectures that I have uh, presented, so much so that many of you have encouraged me uh, to start my own YouTube page. On several occasions, people said you should have your own page, why don't you have your own page, etc. And so in the past year, I did actually start my own page uh, and began to have uh, presence on uh, social media as well. And I started a project which we have called Al Islam Al Safi. And we do have a YouTube page by that name. And what I'm requesting uh, all of you to do kindly is to open up the browsers, whether it's on your computers or on your uh, cell phones. And I want you to open up YouTube, go into the bar, the search bar, and type in Al Islam Al Safi. And I would like you to kindly subscribe to my page. I would also like you to follow me on Instagram and follow me on Facebook and help us to promote Islam pure and simple. That's the meaning of Islam, Asafi, Islam pure and simple. Islam straightforward without our own personal opinions. Islam consistent with the teachings and the practices of our forebears. Islam which is not um, pretentious. Islam, which is not overcomplicated, as we said, Islam pure and simple. This is what we try to teach and promote. And we would like you all to please subscribe to the page, help us to make the page uh, successful, to get this message of Islam pure and simple out to as many people as possible. And Jazakumullah khairan for that. Now, I have been asked uh, this evening to speak on the topic of the signs of our love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And uh, before um, I dive into that topic and mention some of the signs, I will not provide an exhaustive list of those signs, but we will talk about some of the signs of our love for the Prophet ﷺ or that that love is true. But before I dive into that, uh, I want to preface my comments by saying that the foundation of faith and its cornerstone is loving Allah. As Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, فَالتَّسْتِيقُ بِالْمَحَبَّةِ هُوَ أَصْلُ الْإِيمَانِ Affirmation accompanied by love is the foundation of faith. So brothers and sisters, loving for Allah's sake and loving in accordance with what pleases Allah is part and parcel of what it takes for a person's faith to be complete. When a person loves someone or something simply because Allah loves them or it, 
that person's faith has approached completeness. While the one who loves someone or something despite Allah's contempt for them or it, his or her faith has diminished to the degree that they love what Allah hates. That corresponding, if our love for things is in line with Allah's love for those things, then that's a sign of the completeness of our faith. Whereas on the other hand, if we love things which Allah hates and despises, it's an indication that our faith is lacking and deficient. And this is something which has been confirmed and repeated, has been confirmed and repeated by scholars throughout history. And among the scholars who have mentioned this and stated this in their works are Al-Qadhi Iyad, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, Ibn Rajab, Al-Hafid Ibn Rajab, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, and Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullahu ta'ala. For example, Ibn al-Qayyim, he said in al-Fawa'id, he said, وَكَمَالُ الْإِمَانِ فِي الْحُبِّ فِي اللَّهِ وَالْبُغْضِ فِي اللَّهِ He said, the completeness of faith lies in loving for Allah's sake and hating for Allah's sake. And so from here, brothers and sisters, we come to realize that love is an essential component of faith. Let me say that again. Love is an essential component of faith. Without love, there is no faith. And without certain forms of love, faith diminishes and depreciates. That basically there is a basic love that has to be there for us to be believers. And there, is, there are some forms of love and some things that we're supposed to love. And if we don't love them, then our faith, although it may still be there, it, is, it diminishes and depreciates. It's not complete. It becomes lacking. And this is something which we find if we study the Qur'an and the Hadith and the Athar al-Salafiyyah and the words of our pious predecessors, we'll see this is something what repeated throughout the texts. That there are some things that loving them is essential. Essential part of faith. And some things that if we don't love them, our faith will be, will be deprecated. So for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخِذُ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبَّ لِلَّهِ And from mankind are those who take other deities besides Allah and equate them with Allah. They love them as they should only love Allah. But those who believe love Allah more than anything else. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that true faith necessitates that we love Allah more than anything else. We also have the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, قُلْ إِنْ كَانَ آبَاؤُكُمْ وَأَبَنَاؤُكُمْ وَإِخْوَانُكُمْ وَأَزْوَاجُكُمْ وَعَشِيرَتُكُمْ وَمُوَالٌ وَقْتَرَفْتُمُوهَا وَتِجَارَةٌ تَخْشَوْنَ كَسَادَهَا وَمَسَّاكِنَ تَرْضَوْنَهَا أَحَبَّ إِلَيْكُمْ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ وَجِهَادٍ فِي سَبِيلِهِ فَتَرَبَّسُوا حَتَّى يَأْتِي أَمْرُ اللَّهِ حَتَّى يَأْتِي اللَّهُ بِأَمْرِهِ وَاللَّهُ لَا يَهْدِي الْقَوْمِ الْفَاسِقِينَ Say, O Muhammad, if your fathers, your sons, your brothers, your wives, your relatives, the wealth which you have obtained, the commerce in which you fear a decline and dwellings in which you delight are more beloved to you than Allah and His Messenger, and striving in His cause, then wait until Allah passes his judgment and Allah does not guide the defiantly disobedient people. We also have the statement of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where he says, لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله ولو كانوا آباءهم أو أبناءهم أو إخوانهم أو أشيرتهم أولئك كتب في قلوبهم الإيمان وإيدهم بروح, بروح منه he says, you will not find the people who believe in God in the last day loving those who oppose Allah and His Messenger. Even if they were their parents or their children or their siblings or their close relatives, these are the ones who Allah has inscribed faith in their hearts and has supported them with a spirit from Him. And so in all three of these ayat, you see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala insisting that true faith necessitates loving certain things. For example, loving Allah, loving the Messenger. And despising those and opposing those who oppose Allah. Also you have the Prophet ﷺ echoing this sentiment in his hadith. 
So for example, in the hadith of Anas, collected by Bukhari Muslim, he said, ثَلَاثَةٌ مَنْ كُنَّ فِيهِ وَجَدَ حَلَاوَةَ الْإِيمَانِ أَنْ يَكُونَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَحَبَّ إِلَيْهِ مِمَّا سِوَاهُمَا وَأَنْ يُحِبُّ الْمَرْءُ لَا يُحِبُّهُ إِلَّا he said, there are three qualities. Whoever possesses them will taste the sweetness of faith, loving Allah and His Messenger more than anything else, and loving a person, but only loving him or her for Allah's sake. Again, making the love of Allah and His Messenger an essential part of faith, essential part of tasting, of having complete faith, and loving a person for the sake of Allah being what? An essential part of the completeness of faith. You also have the Prophet saying, لَا تَدْخُلُونَ الْجَنَّةَ حَتَّى تُؤْمِنُوا وَلَا تُؤْمِنُوا حَتَّى تَحَبُّوا You will not enter paradise until you truly believe and you will not become true believers until you love one another. Making the love of other believers an essential part of true faith. He said in the hadith, لَا يُؤْمِنُوا أَحَدُكُمْ حَتَّى يُحِبَّ لِأَخِيهِ مَا يُحِبُّ لِنَفْسِهِ None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself, what, what, he, what he loves for himself. Connecting true faith with loving for our brothers what we love for ourselves. Person's faith can't be complete if they don't love for their brother what they love for themselves. Another example, the Prophet said in the hadith, Ayatul Iman Hubb al Ansar. Wa ayatul nifaq bughd al Ansar. He said the sign of faith, of true faith, is loving the Ansar. And the sign of hypocrisy is despising the Ansar. And you have the Prophet saying in the hadith, مَنْ أَحَبَّ لِلَّهِ وَأَبْغَضَ لِلَّهِ وَأَعْطَى لِلَّهِ وَمَنَعَ لِلَّهِ وَمَنَعَ لِلَّهِ إِسْتَكْمَلَ الْإِيمَانِ فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ الْإِيمَانِ He said, he who loves for Allah's sake, hates for Allah's sake, gives for Allah's sake, withholds for Allah's sake, his faith at that point has most certainly been perfected, has been completed. And you have Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu when he was discussing the importance and the essential nature of loving for Allah's sake and hating for Allah's sake he said walan yajida abdun ta'ma al-imani walaw kathara salatuhu wa sawmu hatta yakuna kadhalik he said a person will not find the true essence of faith even if he frequently prays and fasts until he is like that loving for Allah's sake and hating for Allah's sake what do all of these nusus, what do all of these texts teach us, brothers and sisters? What's the common theme? They clearly demonstrate the essential nature of love to religion in general and faith in particular. That loving what Allah loves, loving Allah, loving His Messenger, loving the believers, loving for people what we love for ourselves, they go hand in hand with having true faith. And so this means that if loving anyone or anything beyond ourselves does not come natural to us or is something we struggle with, then we are, required, we are required to train ourselves to love what faith requires us to love and to hate what faith requires us to hate. And we have to understand, brothers and sisters, this is the true Islam. This is the true Islam. True Islam is not submitting to Allah with your body parts, with your limbs. This is the Islam that the munafiqoon were able to achieve. They were able to execute. They were able to, uh, to reach. They were able to do that. They were able to submit outwardly, but they didn't submit inwardly and that outward Islam, without the inward submission, it didn't benefit them. And so we have to understand brothers and sisters that the true Islam is the Islam, the Islam of the heart, where our hearts submit to Allah. We forgive even though we don't want to forgive because Allah insists that we forgive. We surrender and we love the people who Allah wants us to love, even though if it were up to us, if, Allah, if we had our druthers, we wouldn't love them because of something they've done to us or something they've said to us or the way they've treated us, etc. But we love them because they are believers and Allah orders us to love the believers. You will not enter paradise until you believe and you will not believe truly until you love one another. So this is the true submission, brothers and sisters. And if we do not do this, our faith will remain inadequate and incomplete. We have to understand this is an important understanding for us to, to come to 
in this month. The month of self-evaluation. The month of self-inventory. The month of, tri- of self-improvement. If we realize about ourselves, I struggle with that. I struggle with surrendering with my heart and doing what Allah wants me to do internally. Then that's, that's where we need to be working because that's the true faith and that's the true Islam. With that said, brothers and sisters, one of the people we are required to love is Allah's Messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. One of the people we're required to love with all of our hearts, as we've seen some of the nusus and we're going to see more of them, love him more than anything else, is the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in one example, He says, النَّبِيُّ أَوْلَى بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنْ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ The Prophet is more entitled to the believers than they are to their own selves. This verse, brothers and sisters, is telling us that if we are true believers, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam should be nearer and dearer to us than anything else, even our own selves. And the Prophet said in the hadith of Abu Hurairah, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى أكون أحب إليه من ولدي ووالده والناس أجمعين. None of you truly believes until I am more beloved to him than his son, his father, and all of mankind. And in the hadith collected by Bukhari, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Hisham, the Prophet ﷺ was with a group of his companions. And Abdullah ibn, ibn Hisham, he narrates the, the hadith and he says, Kunna ma'an Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa huwa akhidhu biyadi Umar ibn al-Khattab. Faqal lahu Umar, ya Rasulullah, la'anta ahabbu ilayya min kulli shay'in illa min nafsi. So Abdullah ibn Hisham, he says, we were sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And the Prophet was holding the hand of Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Umar, he turned to the Prophet and he said, Yeah, oh, yeah, Rasulullah, oh, Messenger of Allah, you are certainly more beloved to me than anything except my own self. Whereupon the Prophet replied, he said, La walladhi nafsi biyadi hatta akuna ahabba ilayka min nafsik. He said, No. I swear by the one in whose hand lies my soul. I swear by the one in whose hand lies my soul. It will not be until I am more beloved to you than your own self. What will not be, brothers and sisters? You will not truly be a believer. You will not truly achieve faith until I, meaning the Prophet ﷺ, is more beloved to you than your own self. So, Umar al-Khattab, he thought about it for a second. And then he said, فَإِنَّهُ الْآنْ وَاللَّهِ لَأَنْتَ أَحَبُّ إِلَيَّ مِنْ نَفْسِي He said, now, O Messenger of Allah, I swear by Allah, you are more beloved to me than my own self. فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صلى الله عليه وسلم الآن يَا عُمَرِ He said, now, Umar, now, Umar, you have truly, you have truly believed. You have truly become a believer. So, Loving the Prophet more than anything else, what does that look like in a practical sense? This is what we're here to talk about, brothers and sisters. What does that look like in a practical sense? What are the signs that our love for the Prophet ﷺ is true? Because I don't think you'll line up a hundred Muslims and ask them, do you love the Prophet? And one of them would say, no, I don't love the Prophet. I don't think you'd line up a hundred Muslims and say, do you love the Prophet more than anything else? And they would say, no, I don't. I love him, but not more than anything else. But what is the sign that those a hundred Muslims are telling the truth? Or what are the signs that those 100 Muslims are telling the truth? That they truly love the Prophet more than anything else? As I said at the outset, not going to give an exhaustive list, but I'm going to mention four signs that we can hold ourselves up to the light of. Are we living these signs? Are we demonstrating these signs? Because these are four signs which are clear indications that we truly love the Prophet more than we love. I'm sorry, we truly love the Prophet the way we're supposed to love it more than anything else. That signs that we truly love the Prophet the way we should. The first one, brothers and sisters, is giving the Prophet precedence 
over our own selves. And we quoted the ayah from Surah Al-Ahzab, the 33rd chapter of the Quran, verse number 6, in which the Prophet, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالنَّبِي أَوْلَى بِالْمُؤْمِنِينَ مِنْ أَنفُسِهِمْ The Prophet has more right to the believers in their own selves. We have to give the Prophet precedence over our own selves. What does that mean? It means that if there is a conflict between what we want to do and what the Messenger wants us to do, commands us to do, we will abandon what we want and do what the Messenger wants us to do. Ibn Kathir, he said in his tafsir, he said, أي حكمه فيهم كان مقدما على اختيارهم بأنفسهم. He said it means his judgment, what he wants, what he commands, what he decides, what he determines, for them should supersede their own preference for themselves. Brothers and sisters, I want you to think about that for a second. What the Prophet has decided or determined should always trump what we think, what we feel, our opinions, should always trump that. Think about this in light of some of the statements that we hear and some of the statements that some of us may even make ourselves. So for example, we've heard people say, the hudud, the prescribed punishments and penalties of Islam, some of them which are corporal punishments, are problematic. They're bizarre. And they need to be updated and modernized. So the Prophet ﷺ has prescribed a certain method of punishing certain crimes. And our take, or the take of some of us, is that his take is wrong. His decision is wrong. And what we decide for ourselves is right. That's not consistent with when Nabi Awla bil Mu'minin The Prophet has more right to the believers. He takes precedence over the believers, even over their own selves. We hear people saying, for example, uh, we hear people saying when it comes to this month and determining the beginning and ending of this month, they say, for example, calculations is the way to go. But the Prophet ﷺ, he said, نَحْنُ أُمَّةٌ أُمِّيَّةٌ لَا نَكْتُبْ وَلَا نَحْسِبْ سُومُوا لِرُؤْيَتِهِ وَأَفْتِرُوا لِرُؤْيَتِهِ we find the Prophet ﷺ saying that we are an unlettered nation. We don't write and we don't count. We don't calculate, I'm sorry. And what the Prophet does, the Prophet doesn't mean that we are ignorant. That's not what he means. He just means this is not the way that we go about determining the beginning and the ending of the months. That's what the Prophet is saying. It doesn't mean that we're opposed to technology. We're opposed to science and learning and expanding our knowledge, our secular knowledge. That's not what the Prophet is saying at all. He's saying that this is not the way we go about determining the beginning and ending of our months and the beginning and ending of our rituals that are related to the beginning and ending of the months. Sumu li ru'yati. He said, fast when you see the crescent and break your fast when you see the crescent. But we have people who will come and say, they will give precedence to their own opinions and say, calculation is the way to go regardless of what the Prophet said. Is that giving the Prophet precedence over our own selves or giving ourselves precedence over the Prophet ﷺ? Once the Prophet ﷺ, I'll give you just one more example, he told a man not to clothe his wife primarily with a form-fitting garment. The Prophet had gifted him a garment, which if he gave it to his wife, which he ultimately did, would be form-fitting for her. So when the Prophet saw him, he said, what, about the, he, what, what happened to the qibtiya? What happened to that Coptic garment that I gave you, that special garment I gave you to wear? I'm not, I don't see you wearing it. The man said, I gifted it to my wife to wear. So the Prophet said, make sure she wears something over that. Make sure she doesn't go out and, and that and use it as her hijab. And the Prophet explained, it's because inni akhafu an tasifa hajma, uh, hajma idhamiha. He said, I fear that it will reveal or enhance her figure or her, her shape. That basically the Prophet is telling the man and telling his ummah by extension, hijab must meet a certain criteria. That a woman, just because she's clothed, she can't say, I'm wearing hijab. 
Because if the clothing is form-fitting, that would violate the hijab because it would then do what? It would enhance and reveal her figure, which hijab is supposed to do what? It's supposed to prevent the revelation and the enhancing of her figure. So this is what the Prophet preferred for us regarding the hijab. But nowadays we hear hijab is a state of mind or it's relative. It differs from person to person and therefore form-fitting and revealing clothes are acceptable forms of hijab. And therefore, when people say these types of things, what are they doing, brothers and sisters? They're giving precedence to their own selves or their own opinions or their own personal preferences over what the Prophet ﷺ has brought. This is not loving the Prophet. Loving the Prophet is giving the Prophet precedence over ourselves. And our judgment, as Ibn Kathir is saying, his judgment being given precedence or superseding our own preferences for ourselves. What is the sign that our love for the Prophet is true? Another sign, brothers and sisters, is practicing the religion, I'm sorry, the Prophet's words should carry more weight than the words of others. Another sign that our love for the Prophet ﷺ is true is that his words carry more weight than the words of others. And his way of doing things, especially religious things, should be more worthy of being followed than that of others. And if we are forced to choose between his way of doing things, choose between his words and the way of doing things and the words of others, we must always give precedence to his way, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I remember recently a brother, uh, he uh, reached out to me and he was lamenting the fact that he got into a debate with another brother and they were debating the beard. And obviously, uh, people, some people will belittle it. Some people will, will, will say it's not the most important issue, but it is Islamic. It is part of our religion. And so they were having this discussion, debate about the beard. And he said that the brother, he kept saying, Malik said, and Imam Malik said, and Imam Malik said, quoting and Imam Malik, and I don't believe that there is anything authentically attributed to Malik which contradicts the authentic hadith of the Prophet ﷺ regarding the beard. But that's beside the point. This person was, was adamant that Malik had an opinion that you could trim the beard as long as there was something, even if it was just five o'clock shadow that could be called a beard, you could do that. And the brother was quoting in response to that, the statement of the Prophet the authentic hadith in which he said, Qassu shawarib wa'afu and liha. He said, trim the mustache and let the beard grow. Let it grow thick. And the brother kept saying, but Malik said, but Malik said. And here what we see, the problem with this brothers and sisters is giving precedence to the words of someone other than Rasulullah over the words of Rasulullah. And this is not the way of those who love Rasulullah sallallahu more than anything else. As Imam al-Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, Ajma al-Muslimun, Ajma al-Muslimun, ala man istabant lahu sunnatu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, lam yakun lahu liyada'aha li qawli ahadin min al-nasi ka'inan man kan. He said, the Muslims are unanimously agreed that once the sunnah of Allah's Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has become clear to a person, he is not permitted to abandon it for the opinion of another individual, no matter who, no matter who it is. And so what this teaches us, brothers and sisters, is that one of the signs that our love for the Prophet is true, is that his word should carry more weight than the words of others. Doesn't mean that we don't respect Imam Malik. Doesn't mean we don't respect the other Imam of Islam. But if the words of the Prophet are in direct contradiction to the words of someone else, his words have to be given precedence. If what he did, his manner of doing things, especially religious things, is in direct contradiction, opposition, diametrically opposed to the way of doing things of someone other than him, we have to give precedence to his way of doing things. That's the sign that our love for him is appropriate. Number three, what is the sign that our love for the Prophet ﷺ is true? Practicing the religion in the same way that the Prophet taught it to us. And that necessitates a lot of things, that necessitates a lot of things, but among the things it necessitates are two things. 
One, brothers and sisters, is that we never attribute statements to the Prophet ﷺ that he did not say or add practices to the religion that he did not do. Brothers, I want to ask, brothers and sisters, I want to ask you a question. How can we claim to love the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah, the Deputy of Allah, the intermediary between us and Allah as it relates to the Sharia, the legislation of the religion? How can we claim to love him and say that he is dearer to us than our own selves and our own opinions and our own personal preferences and then turn around and practice the religion however we want instead of how he taught us to practice it? If we practice it in a way different, if we deviate from his practice of the religion, it's as if we're saying that when he said he conveyed the message, he wasn't truthful. It's as if we're accusing him of not actually truthfully fulfilling his duty. Or it's as if we're claiming that he didn't do his job. Or he didn't do it in the complete sense. That he did some of his job. But he didn't do his job completely. He didn't do it perfect perfectly. And there's some shortcomings in his performance of his mission. And so therefore we have to complete what he did. Is that something that we would do if we love the Prophet ﷺ, the Messenger of Allah, if we truly love him? Also, how can we claim to truly love the Prophet ﷺ and want better for him, not just love him, but love for him better than what we love for ourselves? How can we claim that and then turn around and misquote him, essentially lie on him, say that he said something he didn't say? Imagine if someone did that to you. You wouldn't take kindly to that. None of us appreciates someone saying, hey, I heard that you said something. I, I never said that. Who said I said that? We get angry. We get upset when somebody misquotes us, when somebody lies upon us. But essentially, when we misquote the prophet or we say that he said something he didn't say, that's exactly what we're doing. How can we say that we love for him better than we love for ourselves and then turn around and do something, do something like that? Not only does this contradict our claim to love the Prophet as we really should love him. It also has very serious consequences. One of those consequences being our deeds won't be accepted. The deeds that we do that are based upon these, uh, these misquotes, the deeds that we do that are based upon things which he didn't teach us, but we just decide that it feels right to me, they won't be accepted. The Prophet said in the hadith, man amila amalan laysa alayhi amruna fahuwa, fahuwa rad. Whoever performs a religious act which we have not sanctioned, it will be rejected. Also, if we say something, we say the Prophet said something that he didn't say, then the Prophet has said that there is a threat of punishment in the hereafter, in the hellfire for the one who does that. He said, مَنْ كَذَبَ عَلَيَّهْ مُتَعَمِّدًا فَلْيَتَبَوَّ مَقْعَدَهُ Whoever lies upon me saying, I said something that I did not say, let him take his seat in the hellfire. And so brothers and sisters, we have to understand that again, the third sign that we truly love the Prophet ﷺ as we ought to love him, is that we practice the religion in the same exact way that he taught it, the same way that he brought it. We don't add things to it, and we don't say that the Prophet said something that he didn't say. If we do that, it's a sign that we don't love him as we ought to. Last but not least from the signs that I want to mention this evening is defending the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Ala Alihi Wa Sahbihi Wa Sallam. Defending him against all those who besmirch his memory, trample his honor, and denigrate his teaching Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Sallam. The Prophet said, I'm sorry, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says in the Quran, فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا بِهِ وَعَزَّرُوهُ وَنَصَرُوهُ وَاتَّبَعُوا النُّورَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ مَعَهُ أُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ He says, those who believe in Allah's Messenger, honor Him, come to His defense, and follow the light which was revealed to Him, it is those who will be successful. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says also in the Qur'an, إِلَّا تَنْصُرُوهُ فَقَدْ نَصْرَهُ اللَّهِ if you do not defend him, Allah has already defended him. What's the meaning? Ibn Kathir, he said, Alaykum nasruhu, aw unsuruhu. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is basically saying, O oh believers, you must defend him. You have to defend him. Come to the Prophet's aid. And shame on you if you don't. And if you don't, he will not go and protect it. Allah will defend him and protect him. But it is your duty, O oh believers, to come to the Prophet's aid and to defend him. Now what I want to say here before closing, I want to say a few points about defending the Prophet ﷺ. One brothers and sisters, we have to understand that defending the Prophet ﷺ can take many forms. And the appropriate form will depend and be determined by our capability and circumstances. As the Prophet said in the hadith, collected by Muslim, on the authority of Abi, of Abi Sa'id al-Khudri, in which he said, مَنْ رَأَ مِنْكُمْ مُنْكَرًا فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِلِسَانِهِ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِ وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفْ وَذَلِكَ أَضْعَفُ لِمَنْ He said, Whoever amongst you witnesses a spiritual crime, see someone do something wrong according to the religion of Islam, فَلْيُغَيِّرْهُ بِيَدِهِ And let him change it physically with his hand. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, we don't have the authority to do that. We're not authorized to do that. Or we don't have the physical ability. We're not strong enough to do that. So the Prophet said, فَإِلَّمْ يَسْتَطِيَ He's not able to defend, in this, in this context, defend the Prophet physically. Then let him what? Defend him with what? His tongue. Let him speak out against the wrong. Let him refute and repudiate the people who are besmirching the honor of the Prophet ﷺ, denigrating him, speaking negatively about him, etc. And if he can do that, because sometimes we don't even have the ability to do that, we're too weak and we're in a position of weakness where we can't even do that, or the harm of doing that will outweigh the benefit, there's a lot of things we have to consider. But if we come to the conclusion that it's just not appropriate to even do that, he said, then let him hate it in his heart, meaning let him use his relationship, let him distance himself from the people who are doing that. And that is the least of faith. And so it's important for us, brothers and sisters, that when the Prophet is insulted, that we don't say, well, you know, you know, it is what it is. We don't, we're indifferent. We're dismissive. We disregard it as not important, not something that we have to weigh in on or care about. No, we should be angry when the Prophet Wasallam is insulted, maligned, misquoted, misrepresented, or a mockery is made of his teachings. That's the least we can do, as the Prophet said, That is the least of faith. We should get angry for the Prophet just like we would be angry for ourselves if somebody did that to us. And remember, when Nabiyu awla bin mu'minina min anfusihim. The Prophet has more right to the believers than they have to their own selves. If you get angry for yourself about something, you should be more angry if that thing happens to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. And this, brothers and sisters, one last point I want to make, this applies whether the one mocking the Prophet insulting him, denigrating him, making a mockery of his teachings, whether that person be a Muslim, I'm sorry, be a non-Muslim or a Muslim. And that is because if you go back to the ayah that we mentioned earlier on the lecture, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لا تجد قوما يؤمنون بالله واليوم الآخر يوادون من حاد الله ورسوله He says, you will not find a people who truly believe in Allah in the last day. The sign that a person truly has faith is they won't have love for the one who opposes Allah and His Messenger. They make this muhada. They contradict, they oppose, they go against Allah and His Messenger. And we have to understand, brothers and sisters, that muhada, opposing Allah and His Messenger, it could be kulliya. It could be complete and comprehensive. It could be all-inclusive. It could be absolute, and that is the muhadda, the opposition of the non-believers. They totally oppose Allah and His Messenger. But sometimes the muhadda, brothers and sisters, is juz'iyya. It's partial. We oppose them in some things, but not other things. And even then, it's still what? And muhadda. It's still opposition. 
And therefore, our love for the people who oppose Allah sometimes is going to what? Is going to be deprived of them in those cases when they oppose Allah and His Messenger because Allah said you will not find those who really believe loving those who oppose Allah and His Messenger, whether their opposition be complete or partial. When they oppose, we oppose them because our love is connected with what? With what Allah loves. And our hate is connected with what Allah hates, and Allah hates al muhada So we hate al muhada We hate the doing of it, and we hate the one who does it to the extent that they do it, whether they be Muslim or non-Muslim. And this is important, brothers and sisters, why? Because nowadays, we live in a time where some of the greatest attacks against our religion in general, our Lord and our Prophet in particular, come from Muslims come from Muslims who may have a very large following, Muslims who are celebrities, Muslims who are highly respected and they have certain credentials that make it appear to everyone that they are authorities in religion. And then they say something that even the lay person starts scratching his head and says, that doesn't sound right. But because of their fame and because of their persona and because of their celebrity, we just say they're right. Or even if we know they're wrong, we give them a pass. We can't do that, brothers and sisters, because if we do that, where is our love for the Prophet ﷺ? One of the signs of that love being that we defend him. And defending him, as we said, we defend him appropriately. And sometimes defending him is as simple as saying, that's wrong, that shouldn't be said. And the reason why is because Allah said this and because the Messenger said that. And we live in a time, brothers and sisters, where people say that, where they stand up and say that. They just simply say that, the, that what this person said is wrong, they shouldn't say that. People will attack them and call them names. Label them with every pejorative. Label them extremist, envious, oh, you're just envious, you're haters, you're neophytes, you're Wahhabis, you're madkhalis, you're cockroaches. They label them any name under the sun. When all that person did was defend Habibuna sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our beloved, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And remember what we said earlier about one of the signs of loving the Prophet, it's when he takes precedence over our own selves. When his words mean more than the words of those who are other than him or besides him or less than them. Than them. This is all wrapped together, brothers and sisters. And so we can't attack the people who are defending the Prophet ﷺ because in our mind they're attacking someone who is less than the Prophet ﷺ. Our love, as the Prophet said, for him has to supersede and eclipse the love for our own children, our own fathers, and all of mankind, including the celebrities that we incline toward from the preachers and teachers of Islam. And so these are four signs that our love for the Prophet is true. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who truly love the Prophet as we ought to love him, who practice and observe these signs and other signs and manifestations of that love, and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us from those who listen to the talk and follow the best of it. Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka nabi Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in.